Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Lucy and today we have got the very first Rotting on My Shelf reading vlog of 2022. So as you can probably tell, I have got a ring light as you can see in my glasses. I'm trying very hard not to get it in frame but I'm sorry if it does I'm still trying to like test it out <laughs> but I hope it's better quality I mean I'm filming at like 8 30 at night in January so it's pretty good lighting for it being this dark <laughs> so yes i do have a reading vlog for rotting on my shelf and and for this month the pick is the man in the high castle by philip k dick and this is a very short book which i'm very happy about for it to be a rotting on my shelf pick um <laughs> i have already started this as you can see i've got I've got a few tabs in it already do you guys see what they, they <laughs> what they mean very soon? But in this, it's I think it's described as a dystopian. Well, at least I would describe it as a dystopian. It's basically an alternative history if the Nazis had won, and the Japanese. Uh, so this is set in what we know as America. But obviously it's now been occupied by both um, Nazi Germany and Japan. So Japan has occupied the West Coast. Nazi Germany has occupied the East Coast. And it's basically so... I'm just going to read what the blurb says in the back because I think this illustrates it very well. America. After the Second World War, the Allies have lost and the enemies have conquered the world. Those who survive live in fear. The Nazis have taken over New York while the Japanese control California. Yet a neutral buffer zone between these two rival superpowers lies the author of an underground bestseller that, it is rumoured, offers an alternative version of history. Does reality lie with him, or is his world just one among many others? So what I'm thinking that means <laughs> is that the alternative history that this buffer zone author is, is our history like real life in today it's history <laughs> where the allies did win and this is also a amazon prime video series now so i'm really intrigued to re to watch that after i've read this because i want to know what happens quite honestly um yeah so i'm up to page the oh i've done my standing gold for the day so yes i'm up to page 34 and I think I've tabbed every single page. I'm loving this book so much. So far we've met about three or four different characters and I don't believe that I've met the neutral buffer zone author yet. We are following people who are in the PSA, which is the Pacific something of America. The Pacific, the Pacific, the Pacific, say the word pacific states of america it's the californian side it's the pacific side you know um so we're following um they're all men so far that's the first thing i want to shout out is that i haven't i need a woman there is a woman on the cover i need a woman's perspective please so i i, I do hope that we get a woman in this but my god is this book interesting like so we're, we're we're following one perspective of a antique store seller and he's basically selling antiques before the war so like bottle caps and magazines and like very american patriotic things that are kind of like now i don't know souvenirs in this world because obviously the Japanese won and now Japanese culture is dominant so they don't have that type of culture anymore from 
from America. So it's kind of more of an antique souvenir type feel to it. And it's just, and so we're following him, he is a white man and his thoughts are brilliant because it really just counter flips everything that we know or have been taught about race and racism and like the oppression the oppression and the the leading races type thing like which is very bizarre and interesting honestly because it's kind of like he's so he's he's selling these antiques and he's having to go to this um very private seller who is japanese and is selling to a very wealthy client and he the the antique seller is in his head like fearing different social interactions and making sure that he gets the social cues right in the Japanese culture and this coming from a white man's perspective is so bizarre to me because I mean nowadays white men don't stereotypically seem to have that sort of thought process of needing to assimilate you know they don't need to assimilate into a different into the culture that they live in they just exist they are the culture so to speak um so it's mind-boggling to see that from his perspective because it's just it flips everything on its head and i mean i don't even know when this book was written when was it written let me have a look let me have a little looky 1962 so I don't know if Philip Dick had the foresight or the mental capacity to acknowledge race and racism in nowadays context with the political race theory and all of the socio-economic disadvantages of different races and, and, gen and genders. So I don't know if he's deliberately putting this in here or if he's just putting it in here because that's what he sees Japanese or well I'm just seeing that Japanese because Japanese have controlled this area now but like is that what he sees Japanese people doing in the 1960s to assimilate into American culture like is he just switching it because that's what he sees or is he actually taking the forethought of being you know this is more ingrained this is i don't know how to eloquently talk about this but it's kind of like how does he know like did he know what he was actually writing did he know he was writing race theory did he know he was writing about all of the different power dynamics and like racial dynamics and gender dynamics and cultural dynamics that we now know today through different research and own voices discussions did he know this when he was writing this a juxtaposition alternative narrative or was he just writing from the opposite perspective it's just it's honestly mind-boggling and it's it's taking me down a weird path <laughs> with this because so we're following the antique dealer and we're also following um the man who he is who the antique seller is selling to who is a japanese man and he doesn't have to assimilate into culture because he is the culture because Japanese now controls this section of America and the confidence this that this man has is astounding he doesn't have to bow to anyone like he doesn't have to bow down to anyone he doesn't have to justify his actions he doesn't have to check that the social cues are okay because he is the culture his his country won the war he is top dog he is 
there and he is proud and he's patriotic and he does not need to apologize and seeing that from a Japanese man is brilliant because it just again it just flips everything on its head and I'm just like this book honestly <laughs> is ahead of its time if I may be so bold because the way that it's talking about power dynamics and just it's really good and we're also following another perspective i'm only two chapters in like i'm really not far into this at all frank his name is frank and he is a jew um so he's definitely in the low rungs of society because Nazi Germany won. Um, he also lives in the Pacific States of America and he is trying to keep his job because he's a labourer. He doesn't have any other like skilled um, work to do other than be a labourer. So he's kind of at the mercy of this of this Japanese factory owner because he works as a labourer and he's also talking about like the German um, engineering and kind of the inventions we're talking about like German inventions as well and like one of the things was that apparently apparently and I had marked this as um, <laughs> if you can see <laughs> I had marked this as what? Because uh, apparently you can fly from Stockholm in Sweden to San Francisco in what they call this Pacific States of America, California, if you will. And it only takes 45 minutes with the new German engineered technology. Uh, they fly a rocket. Um, and I just want to say, what the hell? If that was true, if I could get to San Francisco in like 40 minutes, I'll be there every day. Like, honestly, it's quite funny how like everything has been rewritten. Like, oh, there was another thing. There was another thing. Where was it? Right, listen to this. The Mediterranean, you know, that sea, that really big sea, right? Mm-hmm. Bottled up, drained made into tillable farmland through the use of atomic power and this was i mean it i mean it's not even that far off like german like nazi policies of making farmland and like i can't remember the german word but it basically equates to living room or living space and it was a nazi policy of it was how they um justified invading different countries to um, claim that, that land to be able to kind of help the average Aryan German into becoming a skilled worker, works for the land and to be successful, self-sufficient. Um, honestly, blowing up the Mediterranean and making it into farmland <laughs> is not that far off what kind of Nazi policies there were. So it's just amazing how Philip Dick has taken different elements of like Nazi Germany policies and sort of uh, politics and like the whole culture, on it, the, honestly, the culture of Nazi Germany as a whole and exaggerated it in a way so that it's it's actually kind of realistic what could have been done if they had won the war and a couple of decades after they had successfully occupied different countries and territories so yeah so we <laughs> I'm only on chapter 3 so I'm really intrigued as to where they go. I don't know what the plot of this is. Like quite honestly, I've been filming for 17 minutes and 
I do not know what the plot of this book is. I just, I think this is more of an expose into what could have been rather than anything else. Or at least that's what I'm taking as an expectation for me. Because as again, I am only like 30 pages in. But I can't wait until we meet this buffer zone author who has this alternative of history where I'm assuming it's the one in which the Allies won and Nazi Germany was, was um, what's that word? Not disemboweled. <laughs> Not disillusioned. What's that word? Oh, this is why I shouldn't film late at night because my brain switches off. Dis. Disassembled? That's not the word. It kind of means disassembled. Diminished? No. <sighs> why is this so difficult? I keep wanting to say destroyed, but that's just a bit too harsh to say. Dis. What is that word? I can't think. I've lost the train of my thought now. I really have. Nazi Germany was disassembled. I don't know what other word to use. That's not the word I want to use, but it kind of goes along that line. <laughs> oh my God. Honestly, you're, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. I, it Honestly, I'm gonna wake up in the middle of the night and I'm gonna remember what that fucking word was. Okay, anyway. So, <laughs> so yes, I'm gonna be reading this book for this vlog. Hope you enjoy. So I've just got to the 100 page mark of this and I am confused a little bit. <laughs> so I am enjoying seeing how history has been rewritten and the way that Philip Dick is completely turning history on its head and reimagining everything, every battle, every scene, every sort of historical event that happened and changing it. I'm enjoying that and I'm interested to see how much more I can learn from this. But I don't know what the plot of this is. Like, a hundred pages in, Especially with this being such a short book, it's only 250 pages. I would have thought that a plot would have made itself known by now. And I don't know what's going to happen. So we're still following those three perspectives that I first spoke to you about. But we're also following Juliana, who is Frank Fink's ex-wife. So... Thank God we have another, we have an actual female perspective. Um, and she lives in the free part, like the buffer zone, um, which is still America, basically. It's still, like, she's in Utah, she's in the Rockies, like, this, it's still the same place. Colorado and Utah are, like, that's, that's sort of part of America. 
Um, so we're following her point of view as well, as she's a judo instructor. <laughs> Don't ask me why. And she's met this guy who she's now having a relationship with. Just like, it, it was literally just a one night stand. So, I mean, kudos for 1960s knowing and not shaming a one night stand for a woman to have. But apart from that, um, yeah, she's just embarked on this one night stand with this guy that she's just met, who's a truck driver passing through. And they're talking about this book that they've, that he has read, and it's an alternative history to how they believe the end of the war happened. So in this, the Allies won, and the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan were diminished and completely rewritten, basically. Um, so they're talking about that. So that's the first time that we've heard of this author that we read about in the synopsis. And also countering on from that perspective, we're still following, and we're also following another perspective, which counters this, um, another perspective who is, Mr. Baines, I believe his name is. Mr. Baines, who is Mr. Baines. And he is presenting himself as Swedish and he's come over to San Francisco for business. And if you remember, I spoke about a Japanese man who was acquiring after the antique, any sort of American antiques to present a businessman with it. And Mr. Baines is the person who got the antique. It ended up being a Mickey Mouse uh, watch. <laughs> and a bizarre, like, <laughs> the way they presented it was like, yes, this is like 1936 original, only 10 of its kind Mickey Mouse watch. And I'm just like, that's a bit underwhelming you know, out of all the things of of American history that is of, of importance, <laughs> of importance. And you give him a Mickey Mouse watch? Uh, I mean, why, but okay, whatever. Um, so yes. And Frank Fink's employer is another perspective that we follow as well. So there is actually so many people that we follow. <laughs> um, and his name is Mr. Linden Matson. And he also spoke about this book called The Gross The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. And this is by um Abbotson. And so that's the story in which you've got the alternative history. And he's talking about it as well. So I'm like, does it will is this like the story of how every perspective gains this story, gains this book, and then goes to find Abbotson, discovers more about this? like alternative history, I don't know what's happening. Um, one other thing that was explained in this book is that the man in the high castle is the author. Like he calls himself the man in the high castle, Abbotson, he calls himself that. And he lives in, as I said, he lives in the buffer zone. So I don't know, like, is this, is the whole plot of this is finding out what's happening. It's like, is the whole plot of this discover this alternative history and just like rewrite history. I don't know, honestly, I'm so confused. And there's so many different narratives in this that I am struggling a little bit trying to work out who each of them are and what they are and what they're doing and their sort of thought processes. I do kind of understand how most of them interact with them, but it's just so many different perspectives, and I'm just like, I'm only 100 pages in, and I'm confused. So, yeah, but one of these things, one of these, like, the way that they've rewritten history is so interesting, and so it, it seems to be the fact that Japan's got their own empire, Germany's got their own empire, and Italy's also got their own empire, so, because most of this book has literally just been about how Japan and Germany have taken over since the end of World War Two, And they kind of left out Italy there because, you know, Italy was an Axis power, so 
yeah. But apparently, Italy has a little empire in the Middle East that is called the musical comedy New Rome. So yeah, that's that's great. <laughs> There's a lot of like talk about the different Nazi politics in this, and I definitely think that this is an expose into Nazi politics and the way that there is a lot of parallels that can be drawn with capitalism and the West and like America and Britain in particular. Like in this, they say, um, they talk about the things the Nazis did to the Jews. The British have done worse. In the Battle of London, those fire weapons, phosphorus and oil, I saw a few of the German troops afterwards. Boat after boat burned to a cinder. Those pipes under the water turned the sea to fire. And on civilian populations, by those mass fire bomb bombings, raids that Churchill thought were going to save the war at the last moment. Those terror attacks on Hamburg and Essen, and it carries on from there. So I think, even though I don't know the plot of this, I think that the whole sort of, overarching theme of this book is going to be saying you know we're hypocrites if we don't look at ourselves and also assess the similarities that we have with Nazi politics and the whole ethos of we're condemning them for their treatment of different races and their sort of but we're not looking at ourselves but we also need to look at ourselves and see what we're doing as well. I mean, the British Empire, the Union Jack, it's a shit show, completely. And the whole empire of like, the sun never sets on the empire, that whole jargon of just pure imperialistic coloni colonialism is, I think is a very, poignant thing of this book and how it's trying to assess you know we pat ourselves on the back from saving the world from Nazism but maybe we should also look at ourselves and understand the hurt that we've also done on the planet and the way that capitalism and colonialism and imperialism has had such an effect on the world that you know, we can't call ourselves, we can't sort of put ourselves on the high ground and say that we're better than people because we're not. <laughs> so I think that's basically the crux of what I'm getting at from this book. It's definitely character led. <laughs> if you don't like the characters, you, or if you're not intrigued by their characters, probably will be like well, what the point is is in this book which I'm kind of getting to that level 100 pages in I'm kind of like I need some sort of plot right now so I'm hoping that some of the plot develops into where we're going to be trying to find this Abbotson who's the author of The Grasshopper Lies Heavy um, goes into more of his life and like how he came up with this idea and how it kind of intersects back into all of the narratives that we're following so I'm hoping that's where it goes so that it kind of picks up a bit because at the moment a little bit bored not gonna lie so I will probably check in with you when I hit the 200 page mark of this and can give you some more of my thoughts as to how this is developing cool good morning everyone so it is now what day is it? Thursday. Thursday. Um, so happy Thursday. <laughs> you will not be watching this on Thursday. But anyway. Um, I'm at work. I'm in my little office. Um, but I wanted to update you on my reading because it's not going well. Um, I haven't yet reached the 200 page mark of this. I'm on 164 and I don't like it <laughs> and that actually really pains me to say this because I was enjoying it so much on the first 100 pages I was like yes this is going places like my little historian brain came back and I was like oh yes look at the different alternative histories it's so cool the power dynamics all oh, racism is just like flipped on its head and now they're being racist against a white man and he's being called a barbarian and it's all so cool and I was like interested 
right? And then I got over the 100 page mark and it just fell flat. It just, I, I don't know about you, but like I give a book around 100 pages to really get my feet into the story. I know what's happening. The world building's been established. We know a semblance of a plot that is going on in this book. But that did not happen. I do not know what the plot of this book is. Like, when I vaguely said to you before, I think we may be finding this author who lives in the buffer zone and has um, written this book called The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, which has an alternative history in it where the Americans won. I'm now 164 pages in and they still have not even suggested trying to find the author. So I'm like, is that even the plot? I don't know because at the moment we are just following a bunch of characters that are not well rounded enough going about their days that's honestly what we're doing and i get it it's a different world it's interesting to see the power dynamics and how they do go about their own day because i mean the antique seller who i told you about earlier he's a he's a white man which in our society is kind of like the top dog <sighs> because of hierarchy and patriarchy, etc., etc. Um, but in this world, he's the low rungs. It's interesting to see that and like, but, <sighs> so he went to dinner with this Japanese couple who he was trying to make a sale on from the antique shop. And it was so annoying. I just had to sit through him pages after pages of just like drooling over this Japanese woman, married Japanese woman, and I was just like, this is gross. It's just, it's honestly gross. And I was like, can you please, she hasn't made any sort of um, intentions known that she's interested in him. He is, she's married <laughs> and he is weird. So I want to see, oh, I was just grossed out by it all. So I was just like, why are we following this man? He's just sitting there at this table trying not to make a faux pas because he thinks he's a white barbarian that doesn't know manners which is interesting from the historical point of view of the connotations of that language and everything like that I understand that I get that but this is a novel this is fiction I'm not reading a historical piece I'm not reading an essay about power dynamics you know this is not non-fiction so at this point i was like i need to be entertained as well as interested in the history i need to be in i need to have some sort of plot i need to have these characters to be well-rounded and whole and just <sighs> that was like my first gripe of this book so far is that the, the plot is going nowhere we're just it, it's just character led we're following so many different points of views they're trying to mesh together and it's failing <laughs> and then my second gripe with this book is the writing style oh my god i've never been so frustrated by a writing style before in my whole life so i'll give you an example because i, I don't want to actually take a page out of this because it may be spoilers it might not be i mean i don't know at this point but Take this sentence for instance. I went to the market today and I bought some green apples. Very standard sentence. You know, you think to yourself, that was a complete sentence. I know the information from that and I know the context. <laughs> How he would write this, Philip Dick, he would be, went to market, stop. Bought green apples, stop. That was two sentences. And there was no contact, there was no, like, it was just those sort of like little words of like, I went to the market today and I bought some green apples. And it's like, it's like I bought some green apples, but he just put bought green apples. It's, it's almost as though he's like bullet pointing the whole book. And I'm just, I'm over it at this point. I'm over it. Like the first hundred pages, I was like, okay, fine. This is just the way he's writing it absolutely fine I can get on with it over the 100 page mark I was like it's slowing down the pace is slowed down <laughs> his writing's not improved and I still don't know anything about these characters very much other than the fact that 
what their job title is. Like everything's been described by their job titles <laughs> rather than who they are as a person. And I'm just <sighs> so frustrated. Um, so yeah, so as I said, I'm on page 164 and I'm gonna switch entirely to audio. I found the audiobook on Scribd. I'm gonna be done with annotating this because I've annotated it, annotated it because I've annotated it quite a lot actually and it's weighing me down that I'm having to take time out of day to sit down, look at the book and read it. I'm now, can you shut up please? I'm now just going to whiz through the audiobook while I'm working this morning and hopefully have it done. I think I have about two hours left to go. Like, it's, it's frustrating me so much that this book is only 250 pages. It's a small book. It's tiny, minuscule in comparison to other books out there. And yet this is painful. It's actually painful. So I'm, I've got, I'm, I've got 90 pages left, under 90 pages left. I think I've got like 85, something like that. And I cannot, for the life of me, continue reading this physically. It will destroy me. It will destroy my soul. And I do not want to do that to me. So I'm going to try, get the audio done. And if I can get the audio done, fine by me. If I can't get the audio done, fine by me. I'm just going to update you with my last thoughts on this book and then be done because... <sighs> I'm gonna actually get to work because people have been yelling at me. So yeah. Finally. I'm now 200 pages in and the plot is finally fucking kicked in. I can't with this book anymore. So hello everyone, it's now the afternoon. Do you remember when I told you earlier, happy Thursday? It's actually Wednesday, that is the status of my life right now that is where we're at in life <sighs> so it's been a great day but anyway i've been listening to the audiobook off and on today during work when i haven't had meetings etc etc and I'm now up to the 200 page mark. I have now 50 pages left. Actually, I think it's 47. I have 47 pages left of this book. And this is the only time that the actual plot in this book has kicked in. They are indeed going to see the author Abbotson of the grasshopper lies heavy and it's only like one character that we're following that is actually going the other characters have all got their own shit going on and i'm still a bit like i do not care um so that's great but finally finally one thing's happened um i've got two hours left of the audiobook left which means i've only got an hour left because i listen on two times speed and i cannot wait for this shit to be over it's 20 minutes to four in the afternoon i finish work at five i'm hoping to have this done if i don't get a phone call at work in the meantime i'm hoping to have it done by 5 p.m. so I can just tick this book off, put it back on the shelf and be done with it. Like the back of this says, like there's a quote, all these hundreds of thousands in this city here, do they imagine that they live in a sane world or do they glimpse, guess the future? Or do they guess, glimpse the truth? And like the other question on here at the bottom of the synopsis says does reality lie with him as in the author or is his world just one among many others there so to, to me that 
plays on like a science fiction sort of sci-fi otherworldly element to this book and this is very much rooted in in reality like it's yes it's a different reality in the fact that um history has worked out differently but you're still reading about people going to the shops you're still people about people going for dinner together you're still you're still following people who have jobs like a shopkeeper or a judo instructor like you still have those sort of like regular things that we know is regular in this reality there is no sort of like thought of them saying to them i wonder if there's different realities out there as in like parallel realities there's just this sense of like a what if question sort of like what if the americans had won what if the British had won, what if Germany had lost? Like it's not a sense of like, where does reality lie? As in, are they living a parallel life and it's like gone wrong? So I was expecting some sort of like, kind of like a sci-fi element of like, you know, this is what could have happened. This is the parallel universe that is you can glimpse into it sort of thing and it will be a glimpse into our reality whereas this is just like some guys have written a book about people who have found a book that is about our history and it's just like a book within a book and it's not even an interesting book <sighs> so yeah i'm gonna finish these 47 pages don't ask me why 47 pages and then take me an hour to listen to. This narrator is slow and I can't speed it up anymore on script on my phone. Which is really fucking annoying. <laughs> it's also really annoying because like sometimes I have to listen on my laptop. And my laptop gives me three times speed. But it doesn't give me 2.5. And I'm like, 2.5 is the sweet spot for me. Like, it, that is, like, perfect sort of, like, I want to rush and get this book done, but I don't want it to sound like gibberish. I actually do want to retain what's happening. Whereas, like, 2.5, like, whereas, like, 2 times speed is good, it's fine, it's enjoyable. But it's not enough when I'm just wanting to get this book done. And three times speed is just gibberish. So, yeah. But yeah, anyway, I've completely given up tabbing. Not even reading the physical, as I said. So, I'll go back to you once I've actually finished this book. I finally finished the book. Yes. Thank God. Um, so, it's now five o'clock in the afternoon. I finished work. Yay. Happy hump day. <laughs> and... I finished the audiobook of The Man of the High Castle. I really should not predict what I think is going to happen in a book because then when it does happen, I can't then talk about it because it will be a spoiler. <laughs> so, there is science fiction in this. Does that help? <sighs> but it's honestly the most bizarre thing. It happened in like the last 20 pages and I was like, you can't, you can't leave us hanging like that. You cannot say this and then never mention it again. It's, it's wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. <laughs> And so threaded throughout all of this is this thing called the I Chi, or I, I Ching. It's a Chinese um, word, so I'm, I don't know Mandarin whatsoever. So the pronunciation is probably way off. So I apologize for that. But it's something that it's kind of like the oracle where you ask it questions and it then tells you the answer. And it's normally you're asking about the future so it can tell you the future or like it could tell you answers that you don't know. It's like this all being all powerful type encyclopedia 
if that makes sense. Um, so the I Ching is kind of like woven into this at every sort of point. Every character knows of it, every character uses it. And that's kind of like the main driving force of this book, I think. Like, it's this is such a bizarre book and I'm, I'm very disappointed in it, to be honest. Um, I'm gonna end up giving this two stars because the last 20 pages or so, or 25 pages, were what I wanted earlier, but I wanted it in more depth. So I was very annoyed that I kind of half ass got what I wanted and it didn't have any sort of payoff for me, anything of that kind. So yeah, it was really disappointing. And the actual ending, the actual like last page, absolute bullshit absolute bullshit did not answer any questions whatsoever left me with more questions and just did not want to resolve anything did not explain anything how they got there why they got there what it actually means how everything was pieced together how d it's the most infuriating book but it's not getting one star because i did really enjoy the first 100 pages and yeah that's basically it. So it's getting two stars because I enjoyed the first 100 pages and I liked the premise, but the execution was not there at all. So yes, that is <laughs> a very disappointing way to end this reading vlog for the first book of Rotting on My Shelf in 2022. That's actually really sad, but you know, onwards and upwards, the bar is not set high, so I'm sure next month's book will be even better. <laughs> so, yes. If I have persuaded any of you to read this book, please let me know what you think, whether or not you agree with me or not, or if I've put you off from reading this book forever and ever. Um, <sighs> I'm sorry, but I am saving you from 250 pages while like worth of just like absolute nonsense so you're welcome <laughs> and yeah if you have already read this book please let me know in the comments what you thought about it did you agree with me did any of this sort of make sense like am i completely dumb and i'm missing the point of this book or is it what i say it is <laughs> essentially but no um if you would like to leave me a comment but you don't know what to comment please can you leave me a castle emoji for the man in the high castle honestly even the analogy of the man in the high castle was wrong i was so annoyed oh. honestly i'm just gonna like dive straight into like a ya fantasy right now just to like sort of like get rid of all of this agitation that i've got and i just want to like or read a trashy YA book to get over this. Um, yeah, leave me a castle emoji. That's, that was the end of the sentence. Um, I hope you're all safe and well, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.